Hey, welcome to Bifocal. Today is part of our business series, and we have a guest. We have Dr. Tim Pavlak here, and he's going to walk us down his journey on how he started his practice. Stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. Today is, uh, is part of our business series, and uh, it's part of how I started my business. And uh, we have Dr. Tim Pavlak here today, and he's going to walk us through how he started his practice and going to kind of just walk us through that journey. So, Tim, do I call you Tim? Do I call you Dr. Yeah, Tim? No, Tim's great. Yep, call you Tim. Tim's hey, perfect. welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I think um, uh, it's interesting because sometimes I'm not sure people think of doctors having a business as much as being a doctor. Sure. But you actually had to, you had to start a business. Yep. Right. You didn't just open shop and all of a sudden people say, Oh, there's a doctor. I show up. Yeah. Yeah. They'll call them uh, medpreneurs actually. Med medpreneurs. Yeah, on other podcasts where they have uh, industry specific podcasts on medical entrepreneurs. We'll call them medpreneurs. Yep. Medpreneurs. Okay. Well, yep. I learned something mm -hmm. too. So before we get started into your journey, Probably be good for the listeners. Give me an idea. Walk us through what your what your practice is. What type of do you a pediatrician? What what are you? Sure. So I guess a tiny bit of background on myself. Uh, I am a, uh, a 2013 graduate from the University of Akron. I'm a 2016 graduate from Ohio University with my doctorate in physical therapy. Um, uh, my practice is called Physio Orthopedics and Performance. Um, I run another company called the Rubber City Endurance Project. But my primary practice, my and my oldest business, I suppose. Um, is the, the sports medicine practice where we are a cash-based physical therapy clinic. Um, we're pretty unique in that we do not work with insurance companies directly. Uh, we are paid directly by our consumer, puts us in a unique category. Um, and we, uh, uh, we also do not just treat injured patients. We treat a lot of patients who are kind of pushing their performance, who have a specific goal, you know, who are looking to run a certain time, who are running a certain amount of miles per week, something along those lines. So you have a pretty niche market that you're going after. Definitely. It is, is purposely niched down. So are these marathon runners, these professional athletes, mm -hmm. college athletes? What are, what are they? It's a good range. Um, we are uh, so cash based physical therapy is not something that I invented, um, but we are still unique, definitely in Ohio and probably unique nationwide as well. Um, and that we would almost consider ourselves a higher productivity, lower price point. So we're not necessarily, um, you know, really, really expensive and we bring in five clients. Uh, we work with people who are anywhere from new to endurance training, uh, you know, people who are just trying to, uh, you know, deadlift a little bit heavier type of thing, uh, all the way to we'll have a client this year who will uh, probably medal in the Olympics who we worked with last year. Um, he'll probably be a top three. Walk me through the cash base because that probably is something not everybody understands. I know I didn't I didn't understand it until I learned about it. What's, yeah. what's that mean? Yep. So um, a lot of people will reference it as out of network. And so we were set up like a traditional physical therapy practice or a traditional medical practice um, where everything is set up legally and liability wise the exact same way. Um, but the one step that we didn't go through on purpose was we did not contract with insurance companies. Uh, normally how reimbursement works is a patient comes to see me um, from their medical provider. Uh, I would perform a service. I would bill them a unit per a set time period of 15, eight to 15 minutes. Um, I would submit that to their insurance company with a negotiated rate that was already predetermined by their insurance company. Um, and then I would be paid by the copay from the client and then also from the whatever the insurance company contract would say. Sure. Um, where I'm different is when a client comes to see me, they already are aware of the price up front. Uh, there's no like, have you met your deductible? Have you not met your deductible? You know, am I in your network? Am I out of your network? There's a flat fee that they pay. Um, they know that it is not per technique. They know it's for a set time period. Um, and they pay me directly, sometimes using like a health savings or flexible spending account, uh, but cash. So that does apply. The HSA works. The HSA or the FSA does work. Um, and that's maybe less than 50% of who pay. Most people are paying out of pocket because they value uh, what they do. Now you mentioned you don't, um, uh, I forget how you said it. You mentioned something about you don't treat injured. So what, what was it again? Yep. So uh, we're not just treating an injury. So a lot of times, like right now, uh, our caseload myself, and uh, I have another practitioner who works with me, who's also a doctor of physical therapy. Um, our, our caseload is currently around 475 athletes. And I would say probably 25% of those people would say, oh, I'm injured. I can't run because I have knee pain. I can't so run because I have foot pain. 
Uh, they are people who um, are scheduled out farther. They're not coming in like three times a week and I'm not watching them do exercises or anything like that. They're coming in for a, a manual based skill set, uh, which we can talk about moving forward in the episode, um, where they are almost seeing me for what we call like a tune up. They're coming in. We're doing a, a movement assessment. We're talking about things that may be slowing them down. You know, like, hey, I saw you a month ago. Um, you told me you're about to run 90 miles four weeks in a row. And so they go through, they put their body through that trauma. They develop irritations that could cause asymmetries, cause them to move differently. And long term, that limits their performance. Um, so there are people coming to me to almost have performance enhancing Tons physical almost therapy like treatments. It is. Yep. It's very tunics. similar to, you would think, uh, I'm sure you uh, take your car to a body shop. Uh, a race car gets a little bit more specialized treatment. You know, you take your car when it's broken to the body shop or sometimes for an oil change. Yeah. I'm like the guy who's working on a on a race car who needs more frequent tune-ups for so higher So if a guy was training for a uh, triathlon or something like that, he mm -hmm. may be coming to you prior to on some regimented... Yep, something that uh, me and him determine. Um, we we're not using contracts or anything like that. that you're not forced to come back. Um, we're basing it upon your training. If your training volume and frequency and intensity is high, then I'm more important in your life. If your frequency and intensity and volume is lower, then I space you out farther, always based upon uh, how your body's feeling and what we're analyzing in the so treatment session. So it's kind session. of a unique practice. It, it is. It's almost, there's a reason that I don't have the word physical therapy in the name of the practice, and that was on purpose. Uh, I didn't name it Pavlak because I didn't want to just be me, and I didn't name it physical therapy because I didn't want people to be confused with And the name of the company, again, the name of your practice, again, is? Is a physio orthopedics and performance. You have an acronym that you use. POP. Yep. POP. POP. Yep, which is in our logo and how our clients reference it as well. Okay. Yep. All right, so that gives us kind of a good idea of your practice. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to kind of go through your journey. And at what point did you set out that you said, hey, I'm going to go be a physical therapist and I want to start my pool? Kind of walk us through that. Yeah. So uh, um, at Ohio University, I went in knowing that I wanted to work with the geriatric population which I, uh, I am not doing that currently uh, with the traditional geriatric population, like a skilled nursing facility or a hospital. Um, I enjoy the, the conversation, the relationships I've had with patients who are older than me in the past. And I thought that's what I wanted to work with. Um, when I went into physical therapy school, I quickly realized that there are a lot of drawbacks to traditional medicine. Um, and I uh, probably my second year into PT school, I started doing a lot of podcasting, driving back and forth um, from OU to Akron. Um, and started to develop that idea. You know, I think a lot of professors and, and, the, and the kids, the, I guess other students that were in my class were kind of surprised when I was able to start the practice. Literally the day after I got my license, I started seeing clients um, out of my initial uh, area. And I think it's because all the groundwork was laid. I had a business before I had a license. We just didn't, I would say we didn't have a, we didn't have a doctor yet. We just had a business. You know, and what once, do you mean you had a business before you had a license? So I, I incorporated while I was in PT school. I incorporated. I set up every single thing I could do. Okay, outside so before of, you're out of school, you know I'm going to start up. Yep. yep. I, uh, I remember sitting in, uh, in class my, uh, my, my last year and being told to put my computer away, and I was on the Small Business Administration website typing up a business plan. They have a tool, an online tool on sba.org, you know, the small business owners can help, like, put their thoughts down on what they want to do. And it's pretty different than what I do now. You know, things evolve over time. You know, every year I think, man, last year's Tim, he didn't know what was going on, but I'm good now. And then I'll think the same thing next year, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it all kind of evolved from there. So I, I had a business model. I had a, uh, I had an office. I had everything before we had a doctor to be part of the business. I was so going to be that you doctor. Afford, how did you afford an office? Yeah. You just start, how do you afford an office? Yep. So uh, it, it's kind of interesting. You're definitely not taught anything about business in school. You're not taught anything about sales. Um, I think sometimes that comes naturally to some people, but there's a lot of information out there from podcasts like what you're doing now um, to, um, to books that you can read. And so uh, I, I think the, the business started with $1,500 personal loan from, uh, from my, myself you know, and my family. Um, and that's kind of what I needed to get it off the ground. And I went through and I made strategic decisions early on to keep my overhead as so low as possible. You started your business with $1,500. $1,500. Free rent, you know. Free was, rent. Where'd you get free rent? So You uh, got a rich uncle? Yeah, unfortunately, no, I don't, not that I know of. I'm looking <laughs> for him still if he's okay. here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I... Uh, I, I met with, I knew what I wanted to do, and I knew it had to be in some uh, sports-specific arena. And so my initial idea was I was going to almost be kind of like a mobile PT and bump around to different gyms or uh, running stores and set up these, like, you know, minute clinics where people walk in or we schedule in a certain location. That was your mobile PT idea. Was that because you were thinking, I can't afford an office? So exactly. This, that was the reason? Yep, that's before I, I, that's before I realized you could sell anything. So that was part of your 
that's part of the business plan to get it started. Initially. I got to do it this way. Yep, that's what I thought. You know, because I didn't want I didn't want the risk and the overhead um, initially when I, I didn't know if this was going to work. Because there were a lot was of anybody doing that. Did you or did you just come up with that and think <gasps> I think that's a good way for me to get started? I'm sure there are people doing it, but I was not aware of them. You know, I just thought that that made the most sense to me. You know. Um, uh, I, I met with one of the first gym owners. Uh, when I met with him, I explained what I wanted to do. I explained how I thought I would help his clientele. I explained I thought I could help him. You know, when people get hurt, what happens? They quit their gym. As opposed to quitting your gym, why don't you come see me? I'll work on you. I'll get you back to your gym. You never have to leave the doors. So I thought, hey, here's the benefit of having me inside your gym one day a week. Um, and he went home and talked to his, you know, you know business associate uh, who he worked with. And they came back and they said, hey, we have a space in the back of the gym. You know, let's let's see what we can do to get you in there. You know, how much could you afford? And I said, zero. I can't afford anything right now. But here's what I can do for you. You know, I can raise the value of your business. You can say you have a doctor of physical therapy inside of your gym who's taking care of your clients, who's making sure that people stay healthy. And that ended up being a selling point for so me. I added value. To, yeah, you're trying. It's a win-win for yep. both of you. Yep. At least yep. on paper it is. Yeah. Yep. So you got a you got a, a a room in the back of the gym. Yep. Yeah, it was a huge blessing. Uh, it was kind of cool. The guy's name is Eric Wilson, and, a, and you know, a big shout out to him. And uh, he was given a you know a gift early on in his business, and he felt that he was supposed to reciprocate that. That's what the the gift giver told him initially. You know, who was his father, and this was kind of his way of reciprocating that to another entrepreneur. So this kind of fell into his charter plan, whatever you want to yeah. say. Yep, one hundred percent did. Now, how awesome. did you how did you come across him? Uh, so I uh, I met him um, a long time ago when I was a junior in high school on a cruise ship. That's when we first met. He was a, a Talmadge uh, track runner. I ran for Wadsworth, which is local to Talmadge. Um, and so we run against one another, know each other, and we're walking through the weight room on this cruise ship in the middle of the Caribbean with our families. We we're in the weight room. <laughs> and I looked at his shirt and I said, Talmadge, Ohio? And he said, Wadsworth, Ohio? And we we're like, yep. And that was when we met each other for the first time, probably, oh, you know, what well, would be six years. You know, you hear that a lot. People go on a honeymoon and they're countries away and all yeah, of a sudden they yeah, run into somebody in yeah. neighboring town. Yeah. And so you ran. So when you say a gym, I mean, was this like a big, like a Scandinavian? What was it? It was a, it was a CrossFit gym. So CrossFit it was a privately gym. owned CrossFit gym, um, small in, in nature, um, but were very specialized as yeah. well and had a lot of dedicated people there. So I initially honestly kind of had, and a, that was your audience. They, so CrossFit gym was, I so I thought it was, um, and okay. I made a mistake early on in my business where I thought that people were willing to pay based on their income, in terms of for a service. And I've I realized now that people are willing to pay based on their passion. So people don't spend money based on how much money they have in their pocket. They spend money how much they care about something internally. And so oh, I went wow. to a CrossFit gym where I where I thought that hey these people are paying one hundred fifty dollars a month to do functional movement, but with sandbags and tires and barbells and anything. that if they're going to pay that much, they'll pay to come see me. And I realized quickly early on when I left the gym a year ago now, um, I was at 290 clients that I was working with. And I bet I had five to 10 from that gym. Most of my people were not the people who were paying $150 a month. They were the people who had a passion or desire to complete a marathon, to run a fast time, uh, to do something like that. And that was like a big life lesson early on uh, inside oh, wow. the business. Yeah. Yep. So you opened up this uh, office. What did that entail? It was free, but yep. you still, I get, I haven't, what, what, yeah, what's we, that it was, it was two changing rooms. We knocked down a wall uh, in between these two changing rooms. that created a, a larger 100, 130 you know, square foot little office space that I could use. Uh, the $1,500 went towards uh, getting chairs, getting a table, getting filing cabinets, uh, getting all of the manual therapy based tools that I needed. Um, anything I could do that uh, traditional PT uses a lot of machines, you know, and they use a lot of modalities, which are things where you push a button and put an East impact on somebody or use an ultrasound machine to bring blood flow to an area. Um, and I knew that there was some research that was based on that, but it was kind of tough to sell, you know, because when people come into a physical therapy clinic and I'm just watching you exercise, not super tangible. Why not I just use my insurance to do that? And so all that went into buying these manual therapy tools that were lower overhead, uh, kept my expenses lower overall. Yeah. So I chose techniques still based on that same strategic model of what can I do to keep this overhead as low as possible. You know, physical therapy, um, and I've shared with, with you in the past, some people have very good impressions of it, mm -hmm. and some people think it, there, there's nothing there for me. Yeah. 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 Yep. And uh, – and that really led to my model being formed. 
because uh, even in the initial intake, when both myself and the other doctor go through and bring in a patient, we say, have you been to regular physical therapy before? And when they say yes, it's like, oh, perfect. Now I can compare and contrast this, you know? Um, so I, okay, so now you're in this office and you, you got an office. How do you get customers? How are you moving forward to getting do you yeah. call them customers? You call them patients? Yeah, I either call them, them, if they're injured, I call them patients. If they're not injured, I call them clients. You know, so I try and uh, differentiate that a little bit, um, you know, in terms of like who I'm working with. And that's just yeah. kind of more for my charting more so than how are people thing. finding out about you? So uh, initially, I, uh, I I definitely read a lot of books about marketing and I went through and I tried a million different ways and I slowly crossed off things that did not seem to give any clients. And there were things that seemed to hit and cause a lot of success. And I thought this is it. At this point, I market three ways. Um, I try to do my best to uh, do speaking engagements. Sometimes they're paid, sometimes they're unpaid. It kind of depends where I get in front of a gym or I get in front of an audience and I talk about something that's specific to them and I give them a little bit of value up front, like, hey, here's some advice, here's some things you can this do. This is you're doing today or this is what you were doing back then? I'm doing this today in terms of marketing. Yeah, okay. and, I, and, I, and, I, and I was doing it back then as well. I just didn't realize that was gonna be a key to success. You know. Um, I, I kind of initially I had more more time than money and so I did a lot of group runs. I would go out and I would run with my clients and I, I live in the same world that I treat uh, and that I'm an endurance athlete myself and I'm competitive myself. And How race. important is that? I think it's huge. Uh, I think there's a lot of credibility that comes from that. Um, I think people say that you are you're walking you know the walk that they are walking and they feel like okay you're like a partner then. You're not just some random guy who is trying to sell them something you know. And there's no better way to talk to someone for two hours than if you were running next yeah. to them, you know. All right. So uh, you mentioned you're doing some speaking engagements. How are the clients starting to come in? Though? What, what do you think was driving that? Because, you know, as a new business, you, yeah. you're only as good as the clients and the revenues and the customers. Yeah. So it was and is word of mouth. You know, um, it's definitely there's been a snowball effect. Initially, the word of mouth because there were a few clients was very small and now it is widespread now. I, I don't have to work to get speaking engagements. I have speaking engagements booked out until May and June right now, you know, of people who know this is what I do and just know this is a service they offer and they want me to come in. I'm going to I'm going out to Goodyear, you know, in May to speak to the they sponsor the Akron Marathon and they have all their employees open to run the Akron Marathon or run relays. And so I'm gonna go talk to corporate and talk to their other office about injury prevention things that their employees can do for the the Goodyear sponsored half marathon, which yeah. is kind of cool. Yeah. Yep. So how uh how much of this up to this point was planned out and how much of it was reactive to what you were learning at the time? You mentioned yeah. you did a lot of studying, a lot of re Are you a type of guy that you're pretty analytical and you research or yeah. are you type of guy that says, I think that sounds good and I go down that way? I'm a, I'm a, uh, and my wife, you're, my, uh, my wife would say this is well, I'm a man of many rules and my, my rules that I operate by are the same, but I've changed everything. So my why, you know, every business has a why. The how and the what are a little bit different depending upon the business. But my whys remain the same, that I believe that healthcare for athletes was broken and every business decision I make is worked on fixing that what I consider a broken model or a model that isn't athlete specific. You know, because like you said, people have different opinions from physical therapy. A lot of the people who have the negative opinion of traditional physical therapy are people who are self-starters and they don't need the supervision three days a week of coming in and doing their exercises they need someone to guide them to do things they can't do themselves and then to set them free. Mm -hmm. um, and so my why has remained the same. My how and my what changes every year. You know? Do you find yourself, um, and we've talked a little bit already, that you have a very niched market. Mm -hmm. Do you turn people away? Uh, I do. So, um, and, I, and, I, and I will even say I did even early on. When I had no clients, I turned people away because uh, I knew the more often I did that. But you needed to start a business. Right. Uh, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to start the wrong business because I knew it was going to be word of mouth. And so if I had a client come in, I wanted them to leave with a positive opinion. And that positive <laughs> opinion would either be I fixed them or I got them to the right person. And when someone came in during the initial eval and I went through and I did the test where I read their paperwork and I decided that they would not make sense to work with me, I said that, hey, and I would make, it would be positive. Um, you know, I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste your money. Um, I don't think you're appropriate here and I want to find someone who can help you. And I wouldn't just say, see you later. I would say, here's a couple of names that you should reach out to. I think you're appropriate for them. And then they would leave thinking, I know what he does because he explained that's not what I need. You know, I had a, girl, a gal come in who probably would have been there for a lot of visits. She's had foot surgery, multiple foot surgeries and wanted to get back to running. And I told her, you don't need me right now because what you need is someone to do some um, high frequency work on you and you don't need to pay cash to come here to do that. 
come back and see me when you're back to walking and you're about to get back to running. I'm the next level guy. Come and see me then. So if you're if you're at a point because you're we're still pretty early on in your the, the start of your business mm-hmm. and you're 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 turning some customers away or potential customers. Yeah. How are you able to do that financially? Walk me through a little bit of the yeah the financial considerations that you sure. had to yeah. I mean, so were you married at the time that yep. you started? Did you have children? Mm-hmm. So um, when I first started the practice, uh, I was married. My wife is a school teacher and is currently an entrepreneur herself. Um, Jennifer Marie Photography. You may have heard of her in the Akron area. Um, yep. yep. And so, uh, and that was a huge blessing because I came out of school and I, I guess lecture at OU every single semester. I say the same thing. When you come out of school, you're losing money. So if you're going to start a business, start it then and chase your passion. And if you can make some money and have some other way, you know, to support yourself from a, a family member or something like that, do that then because you're already losing money through school. So it's not that big a deal to continue to now lose a bit of money now. you could have come out of school and probably got a job real quick. There's, probably. There's demand. Yes. Yep. And and I, I did to some degree. And I had this job for about six months. So I came out. Um, and this is advice I would have given myself from myself current to the, the past him, you know, to say that I probably shouldn't have done that. Because I had uh, Jenny who was working as a school teacher and making the income they were living off of already. Um, and I came out and I thought, okay, I explained the business model and there were naysayers as in any business model. Cause when, when you I, said you were living on it already, were, were you still in school when you were married? Correct. So you were, you were living off of, so you were used to living off of one income. Yeah. Yep. We were used to living off of one income when I was going through clinical for about the last two semesters we were married. Um, so we were used to that. Okay. Um, and I worked another job part time for about, uh, I think six months. Uh, and then I and quickly, it, was that also while you were then trying to start your business? It was. So you had two things I had, going on. I had three things going on because I was also teaching at the University of Akron that I still teach. I was adjunct faculty there. So it was an interesting schedule of a, a nine to three job. And then Tuesday at the University of Akron and Monday, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at Pops into the so evening. So walk, walk me through. And I think this might be interesting for the listeners too is what was the reason for that? Why didn't you just say... This is what I'm doing. I'm going into business. This is what I'm doing. Why were you entertaining three things? Was it financial? What What were the yeah, reasons? I think it was. I think it was the fact that um, I was I was not the only person in my family. I had a responsibility that I take seriously to to support my family, who was myself and my wife at that time. Um, and uh, I am not a risk taker. Um, I think I've gotten to the point where I'm at because I've I've done a lot of small things well for a very very long time. I'm consistent, but I did not take a huge risk early on um, in the finances coming out, and I think I saw that as this is a safe way to do it. And then I got to the point where I was. It's not that I was tired, but I was almost like I wanted to know. And so I said, okay, I know I want to have kids. I know we're going to move out of our apartment at some point and move into a house. This is the time to know. So let's go through. Let's take the risk now. And if it doesn't work out. And I go get an, a more traditional job or I do something different. And looking at looking at my personality, that was my idea then. But I, I probably would have turned into something else. If this wouldn't have worked out, I probably would have done something else inside of this entrepreneur world. Because um, I think that's kind of the way I've trended. Uh, but that was my thought. I thought, let's let's just learn something. Let's take the risk now, six months in, you know, and know something. As you started, um, and uh, you're still in this, o- this office in the back of the CrossFit gym, mm-hmm. um, was there a point in time where you said... I, I don't know if this is this is gonna work. Should I go get a job? Was there any time like that? Absolutely. Um, early on, um, all the way up to uh, my son Luke being born, uh, the month that he was born, I was still not at a point where my income could support us completely. And then uh, Jenny had a back pay or FMLA or something like that for another two months or somewhere along that timeline. And we finally had leading up to that. There was there was the uncertainty. There was a lot of prayer and supplication and taking things to the Lord at that so point. So she she had the baby, and you don't know whether she's going to go back to work, and you can't support on your own. So we, we knew she was not going to go back to work, and I knew that I had to support it some way. I didn't know if that income would come from the business because we weren't there yet. And that was 2018. So I was two years in and still not making enough money to completely support the family. I was making money, but I wasn't making enough to completely support what would be comfortable. You know, that's a tough situation. I mean, I've been there. That's a, mm-hmm. that's a, that's a, I mean, one, it plays on you mentally as a, as a male. Cause you said you felt I got to be the provider. Yeah. I knew that was my role. Now you family. got this wife. Mm-hmm. She's saying, I don't want to go back to where I want to, I want to take care of the baby. Yeah. And, and, but you're sitting, both of you are saying, I don't know how we're going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, diapers are expensive. I knew that everything was uh, it was it was trending. Upwards. So how all of a sudden are you making enough money to do that or to walk me through that? Yeah, so I can uh, I can honestly say that the transition there was there's was one month where there was a four thousand dollar jump in in net income that I have no idea why it happened. That and rich, I rich uncle that darn rich surface. uncle he's great. I yeah. found him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think. Uh, you know, God takes care of those who are faithful. Uh, and there was a lot of prayer and everything that went into it. And there's a jump in my income. You can see it in my books. And it, it doesn't happen every single year in the same month. You know, it's not, it's not one specific. Me, you, meant, you said $4,000. Yeah, it was around that number. That has to be a fair amount of new clients. It was. So how all of a sudden do you, boom, do you get these these yeah. clients. Yeah. I mean, if I was, uh, if I was uh, a guy trying to look really good on camera right now, I'd tell you my secret business formula of that jump. But I mean, the business is like word of mouth is like falling down a hill. The farther you go, the faster you go, the more mass you display. So word of mouth does increase. But there's a, a jump in my income and in my clientele base that's not really to anything from a business principle standpoint. And I think, it was, I think it's a blessing. You know, I'm a Christian. That's what I believe. Uh, and I think that I was blessed at that moment and that Pops is supposed to exist uh, and glorify God through that. So let me ask you, uh, I'm going to ask you a personal question. Your wife is on maternity leave. You got to start making more money. To... Did you literally sit down and pray? I mean, I know people say, well, you know, we prayed. Did you mm -hmm. literally sit down and do that? Yeah, multiple times. You know, every single day there were multiple prayers that went up. And there were other people involved. Uh, we have good friends that live down the road from us, and we were doing a Bible study together. And when anybody asked us, you know, how can we, how can we pray for you? Like, that was my thing, you know, because you, you sit down, and ignorance is bliss. But when Jenny sit down and I, and we do the numbers, and we're like, well, we're pretty short still. You know, this is not a good feeling. So where's your wife through this? Where is she through all of this as far as is she on board? Does she have questions? Is yeah. she sharing the exact same feeling you are? So 100% uh, on board. She comes from, you know, your family. It's an entrepreneur-based family. Uh, and so we I probably should that, clear the air. Your wife is my daughter. Yeah, the maybe secret's out. Some, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, eventually, that's going to probably come around, yeah, right? I would, I would think so, yeah. And so she comes from your family. By the, the way, did you or, did you ever approach me to ask me to marry her? I don't. Did you ever do that? Oh, I'm pretty sure I You're did. You're sure you did? Yeah, that was a scary night. You may uh, not remember it. Okay. All right. So just figure out. Yeah, so Tim is, uh, Tim is my uh, son-in-law. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's probably going to get yeah. out. We'll clear that there. <laughs> Accepted. Um uh, super on board. You know, um, I am good at uh, planning and setting up systems and setting up rules that make the business move forward. I'm not an artist. I'm not a creative person. I would be still be in the back of a CrossFit gym or in a larger brick, ugly building, you know, um, if I if it was up to me. Um, but she she designed the website. Um, she did our books for a while financially. Uh, she's more of a math background than myself. And she was extremely supportive. Uh, and she wanted the idea. She always would ask me, uh, well, you know, are you, are you going to be happy in your job? And I was like, I don't need to be happy in my job. I, I'm just like a robot. I'll just do it, and that's it'll generate what we need, and I'll, you know, I'll live my life that way. Um, but she definitely pushed me to, to chase a passion, um, and that's where a lot of this came about. That's why I'm working with the population I work with because yeah. I'm passionate about that. Well, the reason I ask that question is because I know for me, when I, and I shared in an earlier podcast, for me, when I knew I had my wife's support, that that was a lot. Mm -hmm. That was a lot. You know, if there was a, if there was division there, yeah, that would have been pretty tough. Yeah. So uh, you had this point where you're wondering, uh, can I make this? But all of a sudden, seems like some things took off. Yep. At what point did you say, this is real? This is going to be. This I'm going to move forward. Yeah. It, it's interesting because I look back at that and I think I'm more suspicious of my business model now than I was when I started it. Um, like when I look at it and I think this, like it's working every single every single month, except I think there was one month uh, out of this four years, there has been an increase in billing and an increase in caseload, an increase in the, the relationships. That's not gonna track my progress, the relationships that I have. There's been increase in those relationships. Um, so I don't know if there was like a moment where I said like, I'm gonna make it. Um, but when I look at the numbers, I think it keeps trending the right direction. And when there's problems that pop up, I continue to address those problems. I keep a list of what, what are the detractors, what are the things that are lowering quality of the service and lowering the quality of the patient care. And every single, you know, that list almost like shrinks from the top down because all the things like initially scheduling was a big problem and I fixed scheduling. Initially, the location was a big problem. We're in a new location now. 
Um, so I'm, I'm continuing to kind of like check off that list and grow the business that way. When you say scheduling was a problem, I fixed that. This was a problem, I fixed that. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you didn't know how to fix that. You had to probably do a lot of... Oh, I mean, yeah. that's part of being start being yeah. a business, right? Yeah. How do I do this? Yeah. And I mean, if you, there's been a, that's like the whole, I, I remember I had, there was actually another classmate who uh, was going to start a business uh, initially, and he used something to incorporate called uh, Legal Zoom. It's, a, it's an online website that you can pay to go through these steps and they will do the work for you. And I think when he went through the steps, it cost maybe $300, $400 type of thing. And I thought, that's a good amount of money for a guy who's only got 1500 to start his whole practice. And so what I did, and I, I don't think this is a problem, but I, I went through and I, I did all the steps on Legal Zoom, and I took notes on each thing they were going to do for me, you know, all the way to where it said check out, you know, put your credit information. And I closed the window, and I went through on Google, and I Googled how to do each of those steps myself, and it cost me $99 compared to the $400. So there's no business background. There's If you have a problem, you research how to solve it. You choose a way that keeps the patient care high and the patient quality and the experience of the consumer high. And your overhead low, and you choose that yeah. decision. You know that's a good point because I think, um, you know, when you start a business, it's not about just going in and doing your passion. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff that you have to do. Yeah, you just said, you know, I don't know how long that list was—six, seven, eight, eight, nine, eight, whatever it was. Yeah. but you didn't know anything about that, right? right? So you yeah. got to start. And, yeah, and there's timetables. Yeah. Things, mm -hmm. certain things got to get done in a certain amount of time. Yeah, and I suppose there is a big difference between creating a job for yourself and creating a business. I could just go and pack up my needles and go to a store and say, like, who, who's got some cash? Who can I work with today? You know, but long term, that's not a business model. You know, well, that's an interesting point. How how much of your focus do you think when you were starting your business was setting up things that were going to be solid foundation? Yeah. OK. And how much was uh, this is what I'll do right now because I got to get by. Yeah. So I think I always knew that I wanted to because I had the, the income from my wife initially and everything. I knew I had the opportunity that I wanted to create a standard operating procedure and also work on building a brand because I knew both of those things could translate. And so the standard operating procedure were all the, the systems. Now, when someone goes to see Dr. Mike, our other practitioner, who's my brother, the secrets out, you know, we're all related here, uh, our other practitioner, um, that he goes through the same steps and it should be identical to what I'm doing. I'm not trying to create a separate practice inside of the same building. So that standard operating procedure was created early on and then con continued to be modeled and fixed mm -hmm. and tweaked and everything to what it is today. Um, and then create a brand of who should come here, making sure that I'm turning away the wrong people, bringing in the right people, and then projecting that, you know, yeah. um, uh, to social media. So you're, you're not in that uh, office anymore? Uh, I'm not. We kind of hit capacity where I was seeing the 290 clients out of that. Uh, I knew my brother was graduating. I knew how to make that transition. So I needed to find a facility that was based upon just my billings that I could afford, which is where we moved to the Merriman Valley location we're at now, um, where we went from 100, you know, 130 square feet to 700 square feet. You know, We have a little a waiting room and three offices where two are occupied. I could probably run, I think I could run six practitioners out of there. So at I what point did growth. you say, I'm, or maybe did you reach it? Did you say, hey, I, by myself, I can only get this big. Yeah. Walk me through that a little bit. Yeah, I was I was kind of waiting for that, and I have a lot of clients who are who are lawyers, where a lot of their billable hours uh, come out of outside of their client meeting times. My billable hours come when I'm with a client, and I have a set number of hours per week in 34 that I can do patient care. And I saw that I kind of track like, okay, 34 is the number you shoot for. Is well, that's the max number. That's the max. What do you yeah. do with the other six hours? So technically, right? So you mean the other the other 40 hours or, that are going outside of things outside of patient care? Yeah. So there's only 34 hours where I'm with a client that are available on my calendar. Okay. And so I was kind of looking for a number inside of my industry. It's considered full capacity at 85%. I 85%. Got, that's considered in my, in my industry, 85% is considered close to full capacity on a weekly basis. If you can get to 85% full caseload, then you're pretty much capped out. What's the other 15%? Uh, cancellations. And it, it's, it depends on the area. When I was in uh, Athens, Ohio, which is a um, the poorest county in Ohio, the cancellation rate was significantly higher than that 15%. I will say because in this cash industry that I'm in, uh, I was at the point where there was some weeks where I'd get to like 95% capacity because I had very, very few cancellations outside of people getting sick or things like that. But if you're at 95% capacity, you got to be working at home doing the other stuff. It to, yeah, to some degree. And maybe that's where the other six hours. So I, you're right. I'm not just at the office 34 hours. I am also coming in, you know, 30 minutes before. I'm staying 15 minutes after. And there's other things that are going in. And then there's a ton of time outside of that that are going into all the marketing and, and, and business mm -hmm. model things that I'm doing. Yeah. Um, 
to kind of go back to your question, I, I started to see a number where I got to around close to that 280, 275, and I was close to that 85%. And I thought I started thinking, okay, I'm kind of hitting the point where I need to either I could raise my prices. I need to do something to grow. And instead, I decided to bring in Mike and multiply myself and then open up the availability more. Where now our clinic technically has 68 hours mm -hmm. uh, per week of patient care. So bringing on another person, that's a big decision. Uh, it was. And it's a completely different skill set than sitting in a gym by yourself working on people, you know, and signing so up for appointments. You've been in business now how long? Four years. Almost. Four years. Yep, a couple months. Today versus... Well, I'm mean, even even before I get to today, you brought your brother on. How are things starting to change for you? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm definitely looking at how I uh, I, I guess my, my role is completely different. You know, uh, I think we're settling upon the point that I'm definitely a, a big picture person. You know, some of the more day to day stuff is being shifted to some degree to Mike and to myself, just in a less capacity of doing it. Um, I'm looking about how I can uh, how I can you know, capitalize on income without being in the clinic and without working on people outside of the 34 hours that are billable, you know, which is where the, the second company comes in. You know, that's an online platform that'll be launched here in a couple months. You're starting a second company? Yeah. Yep. Yep. It exists. Uh, it is a, it's an online platform. Um, it is purely um, performance related. It's strength training and uh, endurance training for athletes who have competitions that are coming up. Uh, it'll be a little bit higher price point, and I will take on fewer clients, but it'll be online. I won't have to be in a physical location to do it, which is part Walk of the Walk me through what, like, what, what will you do? So uh, an, it's called the Rubber City Endurance Project, and the goal is to maximize someone's potential inside of their sport. It's only for endurance athletes. It's, again, very, very hyper-specific. And to define endurance with. athlete. What's that mean? Uh, a triathlete, someone who completes a marathon, uh, someone who's trying to run their fastest 5K, something that is uh, probably, you know, over – over 20 minutes long of an activity okay. that is running, so a cross swimming, or biking. Fit person wouldn't be an endurance athlete. Uh, running, swimming, biking is okay. what I'm looking for. Okay. Yep. Um, so they would this this an online service that you would do what now? So uh, the the athlete would apply uh, to be part of the project, and assuming that it's someone that we feel like we'd be a good fit and we can work with, and we bring them on, and then we would use two online platforms to deliver them through an app. Uh, their workout schedule for the day, whether it's weightlifting or endurance training. You're setting the, the workout schedule? I'm setting the workout schedule. Based on what? Uh, based on uh, what their goal is. When, so they're when their races you know. are. Yep. Yep. Part of the application process is filling out what you have coming in this upcoming year. And we'll be in communication via email and text or anything like that. Uh, so I can modify things accordingly. Um, and honestly, it's kind of cool because it's, it's intellectual content. Uh, and it is based upon a brand that's already established. I'm already the person, one of the people in Northeast Ohio for endurance athletes to see. I'm also the senior lecturer for the University of Akron on the fundamentals of strength and conditioning. I'm a good guy to go to if you want to know what you should be doing to get better. How many sport. companies are out there like your practice? Um, probably many nationally. Uh, I want to be Northeast Ohio specific. I'm the Rubber City Endurance Project, which is the Akron nickname. I want to see people that are in this area. So in this area... I would say, I would think zero. How big's that market? Uh, well, I think it's it's interesting. I keep thinking that I'm gonna I'm gonna change how my clinic r runs uh, when I outfish the pond I'm in, and I have not been able to outfish the pond. And it's almost a good feeling when, like I told you, I, I race endurance events myself. I'll go to a race, I'll look around, I won't know anybody. And I'll think this is great. I don't know anybody here right now. Seems like good news and to probably me. Probably the big percent of that are. Potential clients. Potential clients, here. yeah, because they're not usually, most people aren't driving you know, yeah. 12 hours to go to the Akron Marathon. They're yeah. probably from that Akron area. And I think it's interesting, too, is you're a doctor, you have a medical practice, mm -hmm. but you also have a business. Yeah. There's, a, there's a business side yeah. to this, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Business side to that. So how important is marketing? Um, so, yeah, marketing is definitely something where I, I can't keep my foot off the gas, you know? It has to keep churning. It has to keep the engine going. And so I set, I set rules again. I set standards for how much marketing I do every month because marketing, my, the patients I see are limited, right? Because it's only 34 hours a week on the calendar. People sign up online, you know, so there's only 34 hours a week. So when I'm capped, I'm capped. I could, but you have a partner now that has 34 hours. Right. And that increases as well. But from a marketing standpoint, I could market all day, every single day. So I, I set standards. I do two speaking engagements a month where I go out into the community and I set up lectures or I meet with groups or coaches. 
and do those sort of things. And then we, we use a lot of social media. Social media is like a, uh, you know, the bullhorn, you know, for uh, word of mouth. Any particular platform you find is best for you? Yeah, for my, for my, for my clientele that is over, I would say over 40, uh, Facebook. For my clientele that are younger, Instagram. Uh, and I, I'm not really sure if I utilize Twitter correctly. You know, LinkedIn, I have a lot of other practitioners on LinkedIn. Um, it's all branding. It's all awareness. You know, I'm going down to Arlington, Virginia here in, uh, I think, six days or something like that. And I'm getting dinner with the Browns athletic trainer, you know, and that's all because oh, of wow. LinkedIn, you know, so you just keep marketing. I'm not, I'm not expecting any clients from him, but it's a good you person know. to know inside of that. Yeah. Let's just continue to expand the awareness of what I do and who I am. Baker may be coming. Hanging out with Baker. He might need some help. Miles Garrett. Season. He might need more help. Miles Garrett yeah. might need some, need some <laughs> yeah. help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned that um, you're really interested in the the business side of things. Mm-hmm. So how did that, does that surprise you or did you kind of always know that or is yeah. that involved? Walk, walk me through a little bit so, of that. So uh, it, it, it surprised me. But when I look back on what I've always uh, trended towards, it's always been the big picture. So I was... I was never the guy who played like first person video games. I was the guy who played the big Stratego Risk, um, Age of Empires, games that were big picture, you know, build a colony, build a community, organize structures, you know, build a city type of thing. That's how I've always been. And that's why I run the business too. I'm a big picture person. Um, I like seeing clients and I have awesome people that I'm, I'm really blessed to work with, but I really get excited when I get to talk the big picture, you know, and growth models and, and what's working, what's not working and solve problems. I like yeah. solving problems. Yeah. As you look back in your, would you say four years into this? Mm-hmm. What were some of the biggest stumbling blocks? Um, I think trying to, to build a brand um, and to um, establish a price point that I really didn't know made a lot of sense because it wasn't happening already in our area. And so my pricing really moved around a lot early on, and I had to always be justifying it to my current clientele. And so I would, if I raised my prices, I would modify the, the time as well that they were there. If I was billing $15 every 30 minutes and I wanted to raise it to 60, then I bumped it up time-wise too. So it made a little bit more sense logically to them. And I really had trouble finding that price point because it's based upon their passion. You know, um, finding a good in between of how the business model. Could well, run. I'm I'm sure it's based on your passion, but there's also the business side of it, right? That the economics has to work. Yeah. So now you're trying to juggle what's the market going to pay? Yeah. Yep. And what do I need? Yeah. And I think for anybody that's out there looking to start a business, I know for me that was the same thing. Mm-hmm. It was a little bit of let me try this a little bit. Yeah. Right. See, yep. See what you get a couple. You get a couple. Uh, uh, markers out there that says, I think I, I think I can go here. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think I can go here. Yeah. But it just takes time yeah. to get feel a feel for that. Yep. Yeah. That was definitely tough. And then even just establishing like what the, the protocol looked like, there was an instance where I've had a, a couple stumbling blocks in terms of trying to get involved with uh, either college teams or in other locations where everybody has contracts with other hospitals. I'm the small guy on the market you know, the really small guy when I'm just one practitioner. Um, and I'll get to the point where you'll get shut down from things like that. I almost, I was close to having a second location opening in Hudson and there was a hospital system was in the same building and they were like, nope. And it was a bummer because I made the sale to free rent again. The room was being built. I was going to be in there rent free because I was going to bring in athletes to this gym and they're looking for a younger population. That's who I was working with. Um, and I was, the, the room is there still. I'm just not in it, you know, because this other hospital stepped in and said, uh, no, thank you. You know, you got trumped. Yeah. yeah. You got trumped For multiple times, you know. How often are, um, what about schools, high schools and colleges? Is those, uh, those markets for you? Uh, they are, but I have to go about it a different way. So I initially thought that I would, I would have a relationship with the athletic director, um, and then the athletic trainer and I could get referrals that way. What I found is whether you're Wadsworth, CBCA high school, you know, or Kent State University, you have a contract with a hospital system and they provide the athletic trainer usually and are paying for them to be there um, inside your school and all those referrals are then going that way, you know, so it's set up on purpose that they are the doorway person. Um, Now at this point, I do see a lot of Kent State, a lot of Walsh University, Malone, some Ashland, some University of Akron, track and field athletes and cross country because I have relationship with the coaches. So one thing I've done that's pretty cool, it's all relationships, right? That's what sales is. It's building relationships. And anytime I see an athlete, I write to their coach. Hey, I saw this person. They gave me permission to reach out to you. I want to let you know what's going on. And if you do that enough, 
and you have enough success, all of a sudden the coaches are emailing you and they're sending you people. And they're they don't comfortable care. with you. Yes, they're comfortable with you. They trust you because I'm not emailing them. And I'm, I'm not saying, hey, I'm Tim and I sell a product. Can I come talk to you about it? I'm saying, hey, I'm Tim. I'm helping your athlete. Here's what you can do to help me. You know, I'm not, I'm not asking for anything. They're deciding that they should ask me for things yeah. you know, because of that relation that's being built. So where, uh, where do you see yourself going? Um, so I, I always get the question of the, the five-year and the 10-year plan, um, and it's still a little hazy. Um, I know my major goal is I'm going to get Dr. Mike up to full capacity. We're going to get to the point where we are seeing 600 clients or relationships um, and that we are billing at our max capacity. Um, and then we'll make the decision whether prices go up and we drive down demand a little bit or bring in another practitioner. Uh, one thing that's tricky is if I bring another practitioner, I need to bring in another 300 clients for that practitioner or so. I'm just going to numbers along the lines. Now um, your marketing's got to increase yes. and all that stuff. And the, and the problems that can develop increase by 300, you know, because yeah. things happen. Consistencies. Um, and yep. And so we'll see. Uh, the, the next business step could be growing Rubber City. Know, because it's me and it's less uh, time with me in the clinic and more time with me at home. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to get Mike to full capacity and then I'm going to continue to analyze the situation and see what's worth it. Are you looking out more than a year right now or are you like, I, I think I got I got enough to look at for a year? Yeah, I am. So I'm, uh, my peripherals are always operating. So I am focused on my, my current year and then I'm trying to get this to capacity, but I'm also trying to make sure that everything is moving forward. And it's like, Oh, it's like juggling. There's a lot of things in there at the same time. I'm trying not to drop anything at the same time. Yeah. You know, so my peripherals are, are looking at, you know, what's around me, what's changing in the industry. How do I stay on top of things? You know, um, making sure this isn't a flash in the pan, making sure that it's built not on a technique, but on a brand and on relationships. How much are you finding yourself right now where I'm sure when you started out, you're looking at the industry heavily. Mm -hmm. What's the industry doing? Yeah. And I'm sure you still do that a little bit now, mm -hmm. but is it changing at all, or is the is the um, the part of you saying, "I now am going to go this way in the industry because the industry isn't doing that"? Or maybe at the beginning the industry's doing this, so I better stay consistent with the industry. Yeah. And so now I'm going to. It's almost like I switched industries because coming out of school, you were trained in the physical therapy model. And I looked at that model and I thought it didn't work and I transitioned to a different model that seems to work for my clientele. Now it's almost like I'm in this new industry where there are other people who are kind of similar to me that even are almost like maybe a year or two behind me but are in that gym setting now because of the low overhead and things that they, maybe they've seen us do or it's become more prevalent in the last four years. And I'm thinking, well, there's no one ahead of me, so what do I need to do to keep growing and to continue to almost like set the industry standard? Yeah, so I guess that's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, that's where you see yourself now as kind of, I'm, I'm set my own, I'm blazing my own path. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a little, it's a little, it's a little overwhelming, you know, yeah. because it's easier when you can look at a model and say like, Oh, I'm just going to do this the opposite of you. Cause I know it'll fix it. Now it's kind of like, well, I'm at a point where everything's trending really well. How do I keep, you know, how do I keep directing this cash base industry that we're working in? You know, yeah. how do I continue to stay unique? How do I make sure that someone doesn't come up who has a better technique than me and eliminate just because of that? And that's, are there, are there uh, vulnerabilities in your business? Uh, yeah, yeah, there there definitely are. Um, it, it is it is nice that I am built upon one million tiny, you know, sales and not one big sale. So I don't have to worry technically about using one client and losing everybody because I don't get referrals from a certain person. It's a lot. It's a lot of word of mouth, you know. But the vulnerabilities are, you know, I make a, a business move that lowers the quality of care, and then all of a sudden that leaks down to the other. 500 some people that so are the vulnerabilities are kind of in your control they are in my control i could i could make a, a misstep that i think will will raise my you know net uh and lo if it lowers patient quality well that wasn't worth it you know so a lot of the decisions when i'm thinking about spending money i'm thinking about you know what's the goal does this affect my my why right my understanding of why i'm doing what i'm doing um, and that's nice. It's like if you're a Christian, it's nice to have the Bible because you have your little set of like, here's how you live your life. You know, this is how you're supposed to operate. So inside the business world, if I understand my why, I can make a lot of decisions pretty darn well because I'm not just chasing shiny objects, you know, and looking to increase income or prestige or anything like that. I can say like, well, what's my why? Okay, I'm going to go this way because it 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 supports my why. What drives Tim? Um, what drives Tim? 
uh, I believe that, that my life is centered around um, believing that my job is to glorify Christ in my life and to, to be light in that. And I think physical therapy is the industry that I work in. But when it comes to my baseline is that I'm a, I'm a Christian um, and I'm saved by grace through faith. And my goal is to be in the world and to get to have the opportunity. I have a lot of opportunities yeah. to take vulnerable people um, and help them and gain trust and then talk to them about things that are actually important. What yeah. I do isn't actually important. It's just why I'm on this earth right now. I get I get yeah. the opportunity to do important things from that. And that's uh, that's probably another whole show, that topic. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I understand where you're coming from. When you understand your relationship with Christ, that just kind of gives you that center point all the time. Yeah. That's, that's your barometer. Yeah. Yep, your right? centering post. That's yep. your centering post. So every day, every night, every big event, yeah. this is where I get to come back. And the, yeah. that kind of gives you your foundation. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't want it any other way. It'd be hard. Yep, yep. What kind of advice? What kind of advice could you give somebody? There's a lot of people out there right now starting, you know, especially in today's economy. There's new businesses starting all over the place, right? Yeah. And I don't know what the stats are, but it's like 90% fail in the first year and then of those that are remaining another 80 percent of those fail year two you know that type of thing what kind of advice would you give somebody yeah i think the big thing i think honestly it's like it's understanding why you're doing what you're doing it's not saying like oh i sell computers you know or saying oh i um you know run a restaurant it's like what's the what's the baseline model you're trying to get across you know and i understand that i believe that you know, healthcare is not athlete specific, and I've tried to create a model that is athlete specific, and that's my why, and that makes it way easier to make any other business decision based on that. I think the other thing is making sure that you have the ability to kind of uh, differentiate, you know, your your product from others. You know, uh, can kind of compare and contrast. You know, be able to say like it's not just physical therapy; it's different for this reason. There was a cool story that I read time in a, in a book um, called I think To Sell Us Human, where it was saying that two uh, marketing associates were walking through a park, and there was a there was a, a homeless man and he was he was blind and it was really nice outside and he was holding a sign and it just said you know i am blind you know you know and he had a little bucket there for like you know donations or gifts or whatever type of thing uh, and people were walking by throwing a quarter a dime a nickel and the one marketing guy looked at the other and he said uh and he's like i'm pretty sure i can i can triple this man's profit you know with his income you know with uh three words and he's like okay deal you know, I'll accept the bet. He walked up and he wrote three words and people started walking by and all of a sudden they were throwing a dollar, five dollar, ten dollars into that bucket. And what he wrote is, it is spring, I am blind. And it differentiated his product, his product being that he was different than other blind people because he went through and he explained, he understood what his company did that was outside of the industry norm, you know, or understand what this person was that differentiated him from other blind people in that area because it said like, it is spring, it is blind, it made it personalized. So you got to find a way to make your business ring with other people you can't just say we're manual therapy you have to say we are one-on-one care we will take care of you this is personalized it's a relationship i think uh, it comes across as you talk that um, you're passionate about it Mm -hmm. you believe it Mm -hmm. okay i think you live it Mm -hmm. okay whether you were a physical therapist you would still be pretty active in fitness because that's who you are yeah so you believe you believe it and i think I think that's pretty important. I know when I started my business, um, you believed in it. Mm-hmm. So you're running with so much conviction and yeah. passion, yeah. right? You mentioned at the, at the start of the show that you felt the healthcare system was broke mm-hmm. and you felt there was a better way to attack this market mm-hmm. and you believed in it. Yeah. And that's what you did. And I think that's important too, that uh, you just got to have a passion. Yeah. But passion doesn't pay the bills. Right. Your passion's got to serve a market. And yeah. Yeah. And I guess you got to understand what you're, what you're good at, what your weaknesses are, you know, and then fill in the gaps. I know I'm not a finance guy. That's why I have an accountant. You know, I know that I shouldn't be running the books. That's why I brought in someone to help organize the system to do that for yeah. me. Um, have you found through this journey of, uh, of starting your business, is there a, a, a weakness that you have that you got to always make sure I got to make sure this part of the business is taken care of because that's just not my strength. Yeah, it's definitely the, the yep, I have. It's definitely the finance side and the, I almost want to say like motif, but like the, you walk into a room and you're like, oh, this is really a comfortable environment. I am not good at doing that. You that's know? not important to you. It's not important to me, you know, and other people made comments, you know, to other people who are in my, in my little realm where it's like, oh, but it's, you know, like in a gym or there's dust over there. And I'm kind of like, but that's something I would think about. Yeah. I thought of all these other things, you know, so I've had to have other people come in and be my second set of eyes and fixing some of those problems, both from the finance side and from 
that motif for so you had to go out and seek seek help and skill set elsewhere yeah self-awareness right you got to have some awareness of what you're you're not good at yeah you know well hey this has been interesting it was it was uh, interesting you sharing your journey Mm -hmm. and uh i think uh, i think you shared a lot of things that people probably can uh can take, mm-hmm. you know, especially those that may be uh, interested in starting a business. And mm-hmm. I definitely appreciate you taking the time to, to come in here and and uh, and share your journey. It was interesting and uh, we wish you the best. We'll be looking for you. And how do people follow you? If they want to follow you, they want to find you, how do they do that? Yeah, so our website is, uh, it's uh, physio, P-H-Y-S-I-O, ortho, O-R-T-H-O, perform, dot Was there anything longer that you could could have been? You could have. There's a you know if you're talking flaws, there's a couple. My email address is really long. It's like sixty <laughs> characters. <laughs> but if you find me, you're meant to be there. That's true. You know, I got to raise. Yeah, That's can't true. have everybody finding me at some. Yep. You know, at yep. time. Yep. Well, hey, thanks for joining. We definitely appreciate it. Definitely appreciate you guys tuning in, and uh, we look forward uh, look forward to you to tuning back. Thanks. <laughs>